So of course, one of the things you do with your phone is carry it around. And if you're like me, uh, you can't find your way from point A to point B. Pretty much no matter where points A and points B are, being, are located. So uh, a phone is really helpful with directions and maps are also useful for directions. And so we're gonna take a look at maps on your phone. We're gonna look at uh, Google Maps because it's free for a lot of uh, applications and it's got a, a very reasonable API that uh, would be similar to any kind of mapping application you want to do. So if we take a look, um, <clears throat> we're, gonna, we're gonna be stepping through this code, but for now let's, uh, Let's actually run the code and, and take a look a little bit at what's going on. So you'll see that um, I've, I've chosen this hybrid view, which is a hybrid of uh, uh, your traditional sort of schematic map and actual, um, uh, they call it satellite terrain imagery. Um, yeah, and, and there are these gray things that are, um, that are uh, um, overlaid on the map. Now let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, there we go. So this is our pinch and zoom. So if we zoom in, you're sort of like, well, what's going on here? Uh, that too, and you can see that the overlay looks a lot like uh, the 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 um, uh, houses underneath it. So you might ask, well, what's going on here? Um, this was maybe uh, one example where my grasp exceeded my reach or something. Uh, we'll go through this. So I was inspired by this idea that um, this is just a website that shows uh, some uh, places in Austin with some, um, oh, yeah, so some historical context. And it lets you sort of wipe through hey, this is a recent view. This is the view from uh, uh, 1908. So I thought that was a cool idea and I implemented it in a far worse way than uh, the website did. Um, and that's, so what I did was I looked up and found some public domain aerial footage uh, of historical Austin. And I believe this footage comes from 1968. And then I lined it up by eye on a map uh, and specified the longitude and latitude so that I could overlay this um, historical view with the, uh, with the modern view. So this is with and without the, uh, the historic, the, the overlay. So it ended up being um, debatable, I guess you could, you could say, this is sort of the modern version of, uh, what is that? I think it's, uh, oh, it's Spicewood Springs, you can see. Um, and, and there's also, uh, you know, West Anderson. Um, um, so yeah, you can, you can see that the West Anderson didn't used to be paved even in the sixties. Um, so that was, that was the idea. It's sort of, it's sort of, as I say, it's, it's debatable how well it turned out, but that's okay. So that's, but that's one piece of uh, map functionality that we're going to look at. And it is this idea that what's sort of cool about this, it's called a, um, called a, a ground overlay is that it moves as you scale and, and twist the map so that uh, the, the, the map sort of knows that this image is uh, supposed to be positioned on the earth in a particular in a particular way. So that's nice. Then the other thing that I did is if you go here and you click a point of interest, uh, it tells you exactly where the point of interest uh, is. And uh, if there is a, an image associated with that point of it, uh, interest, um, it will bring up uh, that image. This is actually not completely free. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit. There's So far, I haven't gotten charged for it. I've only done sort of a limited number of these. But th th that's something you, you have to keep in mind a little bit when you're working with uh, Google Images um, or Google Maps is that so some of these, um, you know, some of the routing information, like if you want to get from uh, you know point A to point B, that's, that's not free. Um, yeah, North, 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 North Hills, so, so yeah, that's like a nice picture of, of their place. So one of the other nice features of maps is uh, they let you know where you are. So if we want to go uh, to our map and, you know, we're sort of hovering over Austin and this uh, little icon over here says, hey, 
find out where I am and put this uh, informative blue dot there. So I've placed myself in a somewhat random location in Austin. Um, and, uh, you know, and so now I can investigate here. Um, if you're wondering um, about, uh, see, is there a good picture there? Yeah, it's a good picture of the triangle. Um, if you're wondering about how do I tell uh, my phone where I am, um, there's, a, there's a function for that. So you go in here and there are a couple of, so this is the location and you can type in uh, an address, you know, uh, Speedway and, uh, and then set location. And if I go here to the phone, I say, hey, show me where I am. Oh my gosh, you know, I'm now near the computer science department um, on the UT campus. You can also set uh, a bunch of saved points and you can import a list of points. And if you want to do some sort of transport app or some uh, demo that involves moving through the world, if you have a real phone, then you can just move through the world. And if you have uh, the emulated phone, you can put these points in and you can go from point to point and they have uh, uh, support for that kind, of, that kind of functionality. Okay, so um, this is a little bit of a grab bag of map functionality. And then your flipped classroom is going to be another sort of grab bag of map functionality. Um, I think once you get the main idea behind maps, uh, it becomes a little bit of sort of an API tour. There are things you can do with the maps, and there are APIs for that, and you can sort of look them up and, and get them going. But the point of this is to get you started on that journey and make you feel comfortable in terms of using maps. So for uh, along those lines, let's actually take a look at the code. And uh, you know you'll you'll notice uh, immediately. So you know we are uh, first of all we've simplified our file structure for this and our, our layout structure. Um, you know we have uh, a, a single activity with a very simple layout. Uh, let's take a look at this layout. We have these two buttons which we use to sort of pop the uh, ground overlays uh, um, on and off. And then we have this uh, frame layout that wraps a map fragment. So, you know, this is uh, pretty simple because most of what we're doing here is uh, manipulating the map. And you can imagine, you know, you can embed this map in any sized frame and, you know, for one particular fragment. And, you know, depending on what your uh, functionality is, the map is, is very flexible. But just taking a look at it in terms of uh, in the context of an activity, the other thing uh, I want you to notice about this is, uh, in addition to inheriting from app compat activity, we also are defining a couple of these are actual uh, interfaces in Java, and we haven't done that too much in Kotlin because um, the interface idea is a little more sort of specific to Java and Kotlin has sort of better ways of doing this stuff, but these uh, APIs work in both Kotlin and Java and they're specified using this uh, interface. And so um, here, the way to read this is, this is a Google, that, that this activity implements Google Maps on point of interest, that's what POI stands for, on point of interest click listener. And not surprisingly, uh, th there's going to be an, I think it's on POI, click uh, routine that we are going to override. And that's how we're going to find out about point of interest uh, clicks. And then, you know, we'll take a look at the structure that Google passes us and say, oh, what is a point of interest from Google's point of view? And that's where I think the transition to sort of, you know, there's this API, there's that API uh, it becomes a little bit more clear. So I want to sort of, you know, start you on your, your mapping journey. Um, the other, so, so uh, you know, we have a couple of things going on here. We have, uh, you know, an actual map, which is, you know, a, a Google map. And there is um, an asynchronous interface. You say like, hey, get me this Google map. And then you get a call back later when, when it comes. Um, this geocoder, we're, we're not going to use. We're going to use that in your flip classroom. That's where uh, you can input an address and it gives you a location and, and, and the opposite. We are going to look at the client, and then we're, we're going to look at this um, overlay bitmap. Um, you can overlay different things on the map. You can overlay sort of pictures, which is what we're going to do. You can overlay routes. You can overlay these things called polylines, which are you know line segments that sort of indicate routes or a boundary or something. That's a, a classic thing to do on a map. 
Um, and the, the, the other sort of trick I threw in here was because we are actually manipulating bitmaps and we are uh, expanding them, I'm going to do that in coroutines. So, you know, we haven't uh, had too much of a focus on that in this class, but it seemed appropriate here. And, you know, um, uh, it's an, another, another way of throwing in because maps already have this asynchronous feel where a lot of the interfaces are, you know, hey, give me a picture of uh, something that corresponds to this point of interest. And then, you know, a while later, we get this callback from the map saying, oh, here's, here's the picture you asked for. Um, it, it made sense to me to, to throw, throw that in when we're uh, decoding these bitmaps. Okay, so uh, let's, take a, let's take a look um, at, at the map. And so there, there are sort of two things that are going on, you know, one thing is is the bitmap uh, uh, logic, and then and then there's just some stuff about the map. Let's take a look at the map first because that's the, sort of the core thing. The first thing that we're doing is we're checking to make sure that we have Google Play services. Um, a lot of emulated phones don't necessarily have Google Play services installed, and if and if they don't, you should you should get an image that does. This shows you on your virtual devices here this Play Store column indicates whether you've got Play Services uh, installed. What this does is it just checks dynamically. I mean, most, I think, real phones have it. Um, but here, let's go, let's do Google Play Messages. And that's the usage, that's the definition. Uh, you know, this is uh, just some boilerplate code to make sure that uh, uh, we have what we need on this device. And since we're down here, there's, there's also some boilerplate uh, code to make sure that we can uh, have permission for um, displaying and getting the user's location. So it used to be that uh, location information was specified in your manifest. And when you install the app, it would ask once, and that was it. Um, Android has moved to a more fine-grained permission model where for a given app, if it needs to know your application, it asks dynamically and the user says, okay or not. And I uh, can't remember what happened in our demo, but if uh, you've never run the demo before, the first thing the phone asks you is, hey, this app wants access to your permission, uh, wants permission to your location. Do you want to give it to it? Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's the permission checking. Okay. Um, so, and then the, the, the sort of main initialization point here is we're going to our fragment manager. We're asking it to find the map fragment, which is here, right? So this is uh, specified in the layout. And here we're actually uh, giving the path to the fragment. So um, when we inflate this XML, we're actually going to create this support map fragment object. So we've cre we've created the map fragment object. So the and, uh, it's a a support map fragment, and then the support map fragment is a little bit of like a stub object. It, there's not much you can do with it, but it it's there to initialize quickly. And then we say, hey, uh, get map async. So if you think about it for a second, why are we calling get map async? Why don't we just call get map? That's my big pause. The reason is because getting a map is expensive, and so we don't want to wait. Uh, we actually want to do this on a background thread. We're going to go over the network. It's going to take a while. And so we want to be called back when the map is ready. So how are we going to be called back? Oh, golly, here is the interface call on map ready callback. So that certainly makes sense. And in fact, this is the, the function that gets called on map ready. And it gives us a pointer to our map, which we store in our, our instance variable, and then and then we do stuff with it. All right. So the first thing we do is we set the uh, on point of interest click listener, and we can pass it this. Why? Because our activity, which is what this is, is a Google Map dot on point of interest click listener. It is also uh, an object that supports uh, the on map ready callback. So that's why we have those things up there. Um, I'm skipping over the uh, JPEGs for the, the time being. So, and then uh, and then we have to get uh, permissions. This is the the permission checking 
to make sure that we have access to your fine grain uh, location. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, if uh, we do get permission from the user, we have our uh, location enabled, set to true on the map, and uh, the actual um, uh, is my location enabled uh, determines whether or not you have the blue dot. And this UI settings thing indicates whether you get that gray box that when you push it brings you to the, the, the blue dot. Okay. And then we're going to set the map type. So we set it to hybrid. Um, of course, if you're just doing map functionality, you probably just want the, the map view. If you're just doing you know, topo maps or hiking, maybe you just want the satellite view. But we wanted a little bit of both. So that's why we use the hybrid. And then, you know, uh, again, this is just where some things you can do with a map. You can set a long click listener on it. And uh, on there, we, we clear the markers. Why do we do that? Because um, see here, uh, you know, if we if we grab one of these uh, pictures and sort of sits there, and we want to get rid of the picture, we do a long click on the map, and then the picture goes away. And the picture is implemented as a marker. Okay, so that's that's that. And now here um, we have there's uh, you know the idea uh, there's the Earth, <laughs> and that's being represented by the map, and then there's a camera which is the view of the Earth. And there's various ways to sort of locate the camera. The most important thing is, is the zoom and the, the latitude and longitude. So, you know, most things are sort of tied by latitude and longitude. So we have to provide that. And then uh, the zoom is sort of how close in you want to be. And, you know, these are some reasonable defaults. I wanted to start in this area of Austin because that's where the aerial overlays that I found uh, and that, that seems interesting. And so that, that's why I put it there. Um, a lot of times you can find the exact latitude and longitude of places that you want and, you know, having some initial zoom setting, uh, you know, makes sense. Obviously, if you're doing sort of like a walking around app, maybe you zoom in more. If you're doing, a, you know, learn world geography, you zoom out. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's, those are, those are sort of the, that's the basic map functionality. Um, you can see that this is how we get a map, how we initialize it, how we can start to use it. Now I'm going to talk about the overlays, and then I'll talk about how we fetch the, the place photos. So let's take a look, um, going back up here to on create. And let's also look over here. You'll see we have some stuff in our assets folder. And I actually just threw a bunch of stuff in the assets folder because I wanted to have access to all of this material. Uh, you know, should I choose to, <laughs> to try to make it look better and do something else in the future? Um, you know, there's a, a PDF that describes uh, where the scanned imagery came from, and you know, um, the the actual underlying uh, JPEGs were humongous. They were way too big. Uh, if I tried to display them, I got various memory errors on the phone, so I had to create uh, much smaller subsets of the JPEGs. Anyway, at the end of the day, I ended up with these two tiles, tile one and tile two. These are JPEG files that are actually present in my assets directory. I guess let's just take a look at one of them. Oh, there it is. This is the aerial view of Austin. And uh, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, hey, when I initialize this map, one of the things I want to do is I want to read these uh, JPEG files into bitmaps. But I'm going to do it in an intelligent way. I'm not going to read them on the uh, main thread. And why is that? Because it takes a reasonable amount of computation to turn a JPEG file, which ultimately is a compressed file. What I mean by that is the format is small. The number of bits is small because I compute on it in order to uh, get it into a format that I can easily display on the screen, which is a bitmap. So this is a coroutine uh, async uh, call. So I am saying, um, you know, launch a thread with the uh, context uh, of the uh, of our current coroutine context, which if we go up to the top here, the, the final um, uh, element in terms of uh, what my uh, main activity is inheriting from is a, a coroutine scope. So what this means is, uh, this gives it a job object to track um, coroutines that I launch. And this is saying launch a, a coroutine within that context. And what that context means is if uh, this um, 
activity ever got killed or went away, then all of these coroutines would also go away, which is a useful property to have. If you know, if you if you're loading a, a, a JPEG to to put into this activity and the activity goes away, you probably want to kill that that background job. And this is saying uh, run this background job on uh, on an I/O thread, so not the main thread. And it's it's not going to do computation; it's going to do I/O. It's actually going to access uh, stable storage. Um, in particular, we are doing decode stream that that takes a reasonable amount of CPU, and it accesses uh, this file, which is I/O. And uh, this file, uh, you know, comes from our assets directory. So I'm actually doing this with two different bitmaps that I'm reading uh, concurrently with the rest of the work. So when you, when you see async. It launches this uh, piece of code and then returns. It launches this piece of code and then returns. And then all three of these threads are running at the same time, potentially even all on separate processors, such that you get concurrency. You can be doing more than one thing for your application at the same time, because the, the things that we're doing in the background are just reading these files and decoding them. But what that does mean is overlay bitmap one and overlay bitmap two are sort of, they're not objects in the sense that we can just access them. They're sort of promises for objects. I think they're called futures. And so when we access them, we're going to have to uh, do something special. So let's take a look at uh, how we access them. Um, so we access overlay bitmap one, we have to call await. And what await is saying is, hey, um, this uh, variable is being initialized by an asynchronous thread. And I don't know whether that asynchronous thread is finished. If it is finished, great. Overlay bitmap is ready to roll and just give me back the data. If it's not finished, I'm going to wait until it's finished. That's what await does. So async gets paired with await. And that work gets done while we're doing other work on the UI. So. Um, this, uh, this call to await is embedded in this larger call, which is saying, hey, I want to create a ground overlay. And so I'm going to do this ground overlay options object. And what I want to put in the ground overlay option is an image. And so um, you, know, you have to do it in terms of this bitmap descriptor factory, but you know, we're giving it a bitmap. And then we need to uh, position where this bitmap is on the ground such that then the map can uh, move it around and scale it for us. And uh, as I said, I just took a look at these, you know, <laughs> I looked at the pictures, I looked at the map and, you know, I clicked on, on, a, on a, a live Google map in a web browser and I got the latitude and longitude and just sort of lined it up and, you know, came pretty close. And that, that's what, that's what the, this is. This is latitude and longitude of the southwest corner and the northeast corner. Uh, I don't know if that flipped around. That might not look right to you, but it looks right to me. <laughs> this is southwest. This is northeast. Um, and you have to do it to a fair number of digits of precision in order to get you know, the exact point on the ground that you're interested in. Uh, that's what the position is. And then the transparency is I wanted to overlay it on top of what was already there such that you mostly saw the, the image, but you could see a little bit of sort of the modern view peeking through. That would be, you know, if I were to make this more fancy, I would maybe give you a slider to control the transparency or something. That might be nice because then, then you could sort of get that wiping effect of going from the past to the future or the present to the past. Okay, but all of these things are, are just uh, overlay options. We actually have to uh, create the ground overlay, but you, know, you just pass in the option structure. You have to tell the map to overlay it, and then we get a reference to the actual overlay structure. Once it's been added to the map, we grab a reference to it because we're going to want to call remove on that overlay structure. Once that overlay structure is on the map, then you can do things like control it by, you know, you can make, you, you can actually, once the overlay structure is on, you can change the transparency. Uh, you know, you can you can remove it, that kind of thing, and and of course this sorry this whole um, all of this code executes within a, a coroutine that we have to launch. We have to launch a coroutine because this call blocks. This call waits for another thread, and if we wait on the main thread, uh, that's very bad. Everything sort of stops, 
um, because the main thread is cooperatively scheduled. And so we never want to block the main thread. So we launch this coroutine that goes and says, hey, uh, bitmap loader one, are you done? Bitmap loader two, are you done? Oh, you are. Let's create this ground overlay. And then, uh, and then it says, hey, I've created this ground overlay. I now need to run on the main thread. And on the main thread, I'm going to add these overlays to the map. And, and, you know, the button support, I mean, this is just simple stuff, right? I just said, oh, you know, um, let's make the, the, when you, when you click button one, if the overlay is visible, make it invisible. If it's invisible, make it visible. It just toggles the visibility. That's it. I, yeah, probably could have written this um, more compactly. At least it makes the, the logic clear, oh, arguable. This is just a toggle, though. OK. So that's the overlay. That's the map. Let's take a look at uh, fetching photos. That's the other thing we're going to want to do. OK. So um, yeah, and, and, and this is where uh, some of the uh, APIs are uh, cost money. And I'll show you a little bit what the uh, interface looks like on the web. Um, it's, you know, all of these uh, services that we're using that we're interacting with from our uh, 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 mobile apps, they have these web interfaces. And, you know, some of them are maybe designed earlier than others, but they, they, they all have a, a little bit of a similar look and feel. So this code, um, you know, fetching uh, uh, a photo for a particular point of interest, a lot of this came directly from uh, Google because they want to encourage you to do this. And so they give you sort of the starter code uh, to be able to do it. And so um, I'll, I'll walk through this uh, a little bit. You know, we grab this point of interest and, you know, sometimes, I mean, the, the documentation is good, but sometimes, you know, you, you can just go into the, uh, user interface and say, hey, what's in a point of interest? Well, a lot long, that certainly makes sense. That tells me where it is and the name. And then there's this thing called the place ID, you know, which is some, some string that uniquely identifies the location to Google. So that sort of makes sense. And that's, that's what we're using here. It's sort of like the primary key for places. Um, and then, you know, we're just grabbing a photo and, you know, you have to put in this metadata. Um, and then uh, we need a request object and there's a little bit of like a factory here. So we have a new instance, gives us this uh, uh, request, um, places client, where, where is the place, where is the places client going from? Um, okay, up here. So yeah, so the geocode is not used here, but um, uh, oh, don't, don't look at my key. Um, so we're initializing the places, and we have to pass it our, our key, and then uh, we have to create a client, and uh, you know this the, we have to pass it our key so that it, they can bill us these things, and, and that they have to they know that we're authorized, and they they want to rate limit you know they don't they don't want people to just spam request like a million maps which makes sense. Okay, so places client fetch place. Um, you know, give it this place request, and then we have our on success listener, and we have our on failure listener, and so you know, we make sure to log these things. Um, uh, when we get a uh, place uh, response, um, there is you want to grab the photo metadata, and I found that sometimes uh, this was sort of a funny case to me in in the in the map. You know, the, the UT Tower and and the Macomb School of Business; these are sort of you know, important places that, that have um, uh, photo metadata and pictures associated with them. But uh, sometimes I got things like gas stations and uh, bus stops. And uh, when I clicked on the bus stop, uh, there's no photo metadata. So I had to add this null check. Um, OK, the uh, uh, places API, because they are displaying the uh, photos from people, you are supposed to display the attribution string, which tells you who took the photo. Um, didn't quite get around to that. 
uh, but something you should do in, uh, in an app. And then we actually uh, request the photo and we can say, you know, what size we want the photo to be if, you know, we want to downsample it so it's going to fit nicely in memory and fit on the, on the map. And so I just sort of choose these things somewhat arbitrarily. Um, and I didn't want to make the uh, photo request that big because I turned the, the photo into a marker. So uh, we fetch the photo and if we get the photo back, uh, it brings us back a bitmap, and uh, we can put that bitmap into uh, a marker object. And the marker object, you take a position, and it gives you a title. And uh, oh, I don't I could have grabbed the Planet Museum. Let's do UT Tower. UT Tower, and that's a picture of the tower. And um, Oh, the, well, it, you, don't, you don't actually see the, oh, there it is. That's the, uh, if you click it, uh, you see the title of the marker. That's UT Tower. That's, we're setting that here. We're setting the title of the marker to the point of interest name. Uh, the position is the point of interest uh, position and the picture is the, the picture we just got back from Google. So we're putting that all into a marker and the advantage of that is just, you know, then, then the, the map sort of knows how to deal with it in the sense that you know, if we move it around, it stays in location. And if we click it, it moves to the center and it shows you the, the title. You know, you could, you could overlay the picture. I mean, doing a ground overlay doesn't necessarily make sense because, you know, this is not a picture of the ground. Um, but, you know, you could put it in a floating uh, bubble and, you know, move it around. And there's lots of things you can do. Lots of things you can do. Uh, okay, and that's, and, and that's it. Oh, and then also having it as a marker allows us to do this sort of uh, long click and clear all the markers and clears that. So we don't have to uh, uh, have a data structure that, that remembers where all our markers are. So that is about it. Um, this is the on point of interest uh, click callback where we get a point of interest. And then we basically just throw up a toast that says, hey, this is where this thing is. This is what it, what it was. Um, and then, uh, but then we also, we also fetch uh, the photo. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's about it, right? And then in the um, you know in your flip classroom, we'll, we'll go over geocoding um, and other ways of uh, in putting down markers uh, on your map um, because that's that's the kind of thing that you know you like to do uh, you know with with maps. And so um, in general, I guess I would say maps from sort of a data perspective are uh, f much simpler to interact with than say a database because we're not doing sort of complex reading and writing, but we do have to be cognizant or careful about uh, what is happening in the foreground, what is happening in the background, how we update our map. Oh, the one thing I did want to show you before we go is uh, the map uh, console. So uh, maps don't have their own console, but it's console.cloud.google. And uh, this one has a little bit of, uh, a little bit of a complicated layout. Um, so uh, in, in here in particular, I'm in APIs and services and credentials. And the reason that I'm in here is because uh, you need to generate a key. We generated a key for this. And if you take a look at what the key does, the name is not important, um, but we restrict the key to only being valid for Android apps, and we put in the name of the app, and we put in the SHA-1 hash, um, which you know for us is a debug build. But you know, if you put this on the on the App Store, this would be your uh, um, your production key, which you know uh, establishes your identity as a vendor. And uh, uh, the APIs we needed here is Maps SDK for Android and the Places API. So we allow those APIs, we don't allow any other APIs. So if we sort of go over here, you can take a look at you know, APIs and services. This is you know, my particular history. So sort of shows you what the, uh, you know, how, much, how many requests you've made and when have you made them. If we uh, click on the places API, uh, yeah, this is, it shows you some metrics. Oh, it's not, not, not much. Um, let's see, is there, if we go to billing, overview, let's see, 
for you. Here's 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 a really good. Uh, okay, bye bye bye. Um, yeah, so Google Maps places. Oh, you know, maybe I am going to get billed for this. Um, I've got I've got thirty two cents worth of. Boy, I feel like adds up. Thought I thought because I'm a I'm a I'm a Google professor. I thought I thought maybe I'd get it for free. Um, okay, well I, I I don't I don't know exactly how to how to get the uh, uh, cost breakdown in there, but oh cost breakdown. That's not that's not terribly um, informative. Anyway, so uh, I don't want to go too too far down here, but you know, um, you can take a look at the APIs and services. Uh, you know, here here's a list. You know, places and big queries. This is actually some of the other stuff for uh, the cloud services. Um, you know, and this 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 view gives you sort of a little bit more of a, a view a view a little bit more of a visual view of things like oh if i want to interact with uh, gmail if i want to interact with google calendar how do i do that so you might be interested in that for your uh project okay so that's our map functionality demo thank you <laughs>